a fully containerized platform. Um, there wouldn't be much usage of salt in it so far. So it's actually a fully containerized platform based on infrastructure as code. Um, the question is, what does that actually even mean, right? But we have half an hour to find out. Before we do so, um, I need to kick off the demo real quick because I didn't, I mean, I did pre-record it just for backup reasons, but uh, live demos are a lot cooler, so we need to trigger the demo at the very beginning. Um, I tried to show you the full version, but the internet is letting me down a bit. So in theory, we provide a Docker image with all the tooling that you need, but lucky me, I also have all the tools installed. Um, so I just go here and go make build, give it a bunch of seconds. We'll go through what's actually happening later on, but basically um, we're starting to create the instances and then uh, trigger all the automation with it. So that's for that, we'll get back to it later on. Why am I triggering it actually at the very beginning? Uh, it takes around 10 minutes all in all because we're depending a bit on our private cloud. So that's why I need to start it at the beginning and then at the end of the talk we'll go check back, see if it worked and then see the output from it. So short introduction, who am I? Um, I'm Rick, as you know from the agenda most likely. Uh, I'm an SRE at the eBay Classifieds Group Motors Vertical. Uh, basically, we're building a platform to sell, buy, trade cars for various markets. And you can afterwards, if you want to, reach out to me on Twitter if we don't have time for questions, if I uh, don't explain everything enough, whatever, or if you just found talk sucked, also let me know that. You never improve unless someone tells you. Um, so. Back to the actual question, what does that even mean? A fully containerized platform based on infrastructure as code. Well, first of all, it sounded really cool. It contains a lot of buzzwords, right? Infrastructure as code, containers, all that things. Um, but we had to do that for quite some practical reasons. Um, as I said, we're building a platform, meaning we had the opportunity to start from the green field and to do things maybe differently than we used to do before. Uh, before in our case means we've worked on the other classifieds platform for, for the ECG, uh, the German ones, and so we had some learnings before and also some requirements that we had, right? So we started out and thought, okay, if we're building a platform now from, from the baseline up, from nothing, what do we actually want? And it turns out that the requirements are a bit different from our perspective as an operations and tidy and from the developer. So what we wanted is, of course, it needs to be resilient, it needs to be super stable, you never ever want to be woken up in the middle of the night. Um, of course, that didn't work out too well, but we rarely ever get called. Uh, it needs to be easy to maintain and easy to scale. And by easy to scale, we didn't think of buying new blades. So, as I said, the requirements are a bit different from a developer perspective though. Oh, I clicked too much, no. They also like stability, but then that's pretty much all of our common points. Of course, they do appreciate the rest of it, right? They also appreciate the scalability and everything, but it wasn't really when we asked them the first thing that they um, told us that they wanted. They wanted like a share pre-production. They didn't want this works on my machine. Everyone knows that, right? You develop whatever you want and then you run it maybe in a Docker container or maybe just locally. Um, and then you have like, it works, fine. You deploy to pre-prod, it doesn't. And you can't really follow up on why, and the environments are a bit different. So they wanted like real life infrastructure, real life components. And so the solution for us was to build a platform that is all in containers, and why? They're easy to scale. Obviously, right, so scaling containers is a lot easier than just scaling out weights or also still VMs. Easy to maintain, similar setup of hosts. Hosts, I don't think it's called hosts. And everything runs in schedulers for us. So the last thing is actually a pretty cool part, right? So we 
didn't just bring everything into containers and then just run it on a VM, but we decided that we could even have less work maintaining a platform if we just run everything in a scheduler. And that starts from stateless applications that are actually the core of the user-facing platform, but it also goes further to databases, uh, Kafka, Cassandra, all the various components that we needed. So we literally run everything in schedulers. And actually, so far, it worked out pretty well. So we could maybe already check back on our demo. Not yet. Okay, let's go on one more. Okay. Okay, now I get it. So here's what I was saying. Um, it did work out pretty well. We put everything in schedulers, and basically that means for us we're having two different sets of schedulers. So we have for one, does it work like that? We have for one our Panteras environment, which is basically a glued together solution of uh, Marathon, Mesos, a bunch of other components where we run all our stateless components. Um, so think of it as the applications that come from the product development teams. And then we have a Nomic cluster where we basically run all applications and things managed by the operations team. Everything that's pretty much stateful. Uh, why is that? The main reason is we didn't have very good experiences with running stateful things in that uh, Marathon Mesos combination. Uh, we don't have that exclusive, uh, but I think you should could potentially also make it work. So as you see, our infrastructure is extremely lean by that. So all that we really have is those two clusters and a salt master. And that's exactly the setup that we have all three stages through. That means we have production. I think that's, that's what you need to have, right? And we have a shared non-production. And we also have a developer environment the actual cool thing is we have a developer environment for every single developer. So whenever you join, you just log in to private cloud once and you get a developer environment. And that's actually why it was so important to us to automate all the things, uh, all the stages through. Because now every developer is capable of basically running the command that I did when I started the demo and then he or she will get their own miniature version of the production platform. The question is, how does it work? Um, basically, 90% of the instance provisioning is done via Terraform. So if you're a developer and you just run the command, then basically you either use the solution that we provide, everything in a Docker container, all the tools in there, or you locally install Terraform. And then, as I did, really you just do make build and it kicks off, um, it will first create a salt master and then the Pantera's master and slaves and the Nova master and workers. And basically that's about it for instance creation. Makes troubleshooting on it extremely easy, right? So you don't really have to go through every server class when you have a bit of an issue. You only have those two things and the salt master. Um, that is the same setup, as I said, for dev, non-prod, and production. As you might notice, we're also only using one salt master in production. Uh, it has proven that we just don't need more. Why? How often do you run salt? For us, it's basically only once on the instance creation. So that means after that, after we initially spun up our infrastructure, the salt master is basically just hanging around there. So there's literally almost no reason for us to have it in high availability mode. If it dies, we use our own automation again, spin it up, it just comes up within five minutes. And that is actually super convenient because really taking care of high availability with whatever is not extremely fun and also Sol is not making it super easy for you. So that solution is actually 
very, very convenient. And the cool thing as well with that is you see the ease of it also in how our code is basically set up because that allows us to have literally a very, very lean sort code. So really, we're only using rarely any formulas. If you consider that this is basically our complete production platform, um, because the things that we need to take care of are very, very few. So, actually I could, potentially. I don't know, when was the last time I did that? How do you do it? Does that work? Oh. Man. They really see it. I said that up three years ago when I got the laptop and that was pretty much it. Um, okay, let's see. The demo, well, that's a hard-coded sleep time, so that's not necessarily needed. Um, as I said, basically that's the only command. What was happening now is uh, Terraform created all the instances, allowed a bit of time for Sol to basically install Panteras on the Panteras cluster nodes, and initially configure it, install the Docker daemon, the same for the Noma cluster, and then what you see here is basically for convenience, we created a bunch of DNS record inside uh, OpenStack designate. So let me just kill that, and then Basically, we should be able to really just go to the created. It's hard to type your own name. Yeah, so there it is. So pretty much um, the initial creation happened, and I already have my Marata Mesos cluster with the Panteras, and I would have the same for my Nomad cluster. Um, wait a minute, yes. Jesus, don't let me down. Or maybe not, I mean, the Wi-Fi is really not loving me today. Um, the, the one step that I killed now, that it would be the last and final step of the automation is a uh, super amazing shell script. Uh, basically, it installs a tool on top of Marta Mesos by default that allows you to deploy applications, and also the Vault Gatekeeper, which is a not so widespread tool. Um, basically, it's a small tool that checks back with Marathon for state of applications, and that allows applications to easily hand out tokens. Yes, so basically it took us now a rough 10 minutes to get from zero in my dev tenant to pretty much everything that a developer would need up and running. I can go here now, start installing applications as I please, and <clears throat> if the Nomad Cluster is willing to allow me, um, we also pretty much have the same GUI tool to allow every developer to install persistence parts in their dev tenant. So everyone can just go to, to the GUI in their own dev tenant and click get a Mongo database or MySQL or maybe a Kafka uh, because it's pretty hard to get that working in a scheduler, but most of the time it does actually work.
So let's get back here. And I think I kind of rushed through this way too much because we're through already. Is there questions about it? Yes. Uh, so the question was if we use it for production as well. Um, we use the exact same code for production as well, um, but we don't manually trigger the, the job or the action for production. We have basically a Jenkins setup. It's a shared Jenkins cluster for all of UCG. And basically, it's uh, Git driven. So on every push, the Jenkins job is triggered, uh, runs the Terraform plan, and then the Terraform apply command. And then off we go. And we have another Jenkins job that is basically uh, doing salt rollouts for us if we really need to. Um, as I said, preferably, our solution is if you need to change anything, recreate the whole instance and then apply fresh config management on it. Um, but we do also have a job that, that would apply uh, the salt config on existing nodes. Uh, so the question was, how developers share environments amongst share environments amongst each other? So every dev tenant is reachable from every other dev tenant. We have like a security blueprint. So basically, when we started building private cloud, a whole bunch of thoughts were put into that. But basically, you can reach every dev tenant from every other dev tenant. Uh, the approach should be, as long as you're only testing for yourself, do that in your dev tenant. If you want to put it up for people to test their own application against it, uh, put it to a QA environment, which is 100% similar to non-prod, just that for non-prod, we assume things are kind of stable most of the time, and in QA, you're free to just go ahead, test, and break things. Ooh. So if there's nothing else, then I think we are through already. Well, then thank you for coming. The we're hiring part. Well, so it's... If you submit a talk to wherever, you have to go through application process. As with every big company, you also have to get approvals. And then they're like, well, what's in it for us? Right? Because they're shipping me over from Europe here to do it, have fun. And then I'm like, well, I advertise it, so we're hiring. It's employee branding. So yes, we're hiring, obviously. <laughs> Um, so if we use any other tools other than Salt and Terraform, basically for provisioning and config management, no. It's really just the two tools, which is extremely convenient because you really only have to get familiar with two tools, right? Um, so far, there hasn't been really a need for us to bring another tool into the game because we achieved like a 99% automation with the workflow that we have. Uh, obviously, I'd be straight lying if I said we could automate all the things. Uh, for now, basically our major pain point that we cannot automate so far is uh, provisioning of our vault cluster for secret management. Because it's a bit of a chicken egg problem, um, but security is hard. Yes? Yes, we're using a private cloud as a backend. It's basically based on, on OpenStack. So the private cloud itself is managed by a separate cloud team because that was basically the main interest when we started to move to private cloud that the SRE teams and the regular platform teams don't have to take care of the infrastructure down below anymore that much. Uh, so I cannot really tell you how much hypervisors we currently have. It's Currently two regions where one region is 
one data center so it's Amsterdam and Frankfurt. They're building out another one in Amsterdam. That would be the third one. And then we're building points of presence in Australia and Chicago for latency issues. Uh, as I said, we're, it's a global motors platform that we're building. So we're shipping it first to Canada. And we figured that uh, we're having uh, not so nice latency issues with uh, traffic from customers in Canada coming to European data centers. And it's like every call that the applications make to the back end, and it's really increasing the latency exponentially. So that's why we're building uh, points of presence. So that's for that. Um, it's about, on our side, the actual production environment is around 2,000 nodes. And on top of those, it's like you can multiply that by an unknown number because we're running everything in containers, right? So I cannot tell you at any given moment how many containers we run on each separate node. How many developers we have? I honestly cannot really tell you because that applies to every developer inside the whole eBay Classifieds group. Uh, I think for our platform currently it's 75 developers and then the ECG consists of around 10 brands plus minus the small ones. So it's like 750 plus operations. It's like not everyone is using it. I have to admit that. So, but yeah, I would go about 750. Pardon? So, <clears throat> so basically a good bunch of, of things are not our problem anymore, let's put it that way. Uh, so basically containers crashing will be automatically rescheduled by the underlying scheduler, so that's a pretty cool thing that we don't have to monitor. Uh, for everything on top, we're using Prometheus um, for a variety of reasons. Let me let me put that politically correct. Um, Prometheus is extremely lightweight; it's extremely easy to deploy, uh, and basically, it's completely metrics based versus the old-fashioned kind of systems in a style of Naga, Sensu, um, that were super event-based based. based and relying on checks, whereas now you collect metrics anyways from your systems, right? If you don't do that, then you would go basically blind flight, so pretty much everyone is collecting metrics, and now you only apply certain rules on that in terms of alerting, so that's why we chose Prometheus. Um, it turns out that it might not be sufficient for our needs, and we might to bring one of these old style uh, systems into the game, just to easier monitor the, the underlying system. So currently, it's hard for us to see and trigger automation when one of the nodes from the cluster breaks, which is not bad because we plan for an outage of 30%, which is like one zone in one region. But over time, if you don't notice, and you just lose more and more instances, and you never notice because, well, your container just gets rescheduled somewhere else. So if you only monitor the services, you will just not notice until you reach the problematic point. Cool. Well done. Yes, uh, so it's uh, Apache Marathon, Apache Mesos and Marathon. Um, it's a solution that we open source, that we build in-house, it's called Panteras. Uh, it basically contains Marathon, Mesos, Console, Registrator, and Fabio. Uh, it's open sourced by the ECG, yes. So it's basically, as I said, Marathon, Mesos, 
Consul, Fabio, and Registrator, and we put some glue code in addition to it and stuck it all in a Docker image. So basically, even our like our platform as a service solution itself is running in a Docker container. Um, even less to worry about. Yes, so it's open source and it's still actively maintained. Yes, didn't see. So basically when we started out doing that, Kubernetes was not really around, right? So uh, we started building Panteras like five years ago, I think. So there was, there was no Kubernetes back then. Currently, um, we are evaluating if it makes sense to move to Kubernetes or not. Um, it does give you a bunch of problems if you're running it on a private OpenStack cloud. Um, because basically, there are solutions for that, and there's already a bunch of code that allows you to easily deploy it and whatnot, but that assumes that you have certain rights on your OpenStack, which we do not because we have the underlying cloud team that is managing that, so we're, we're basically running in a bit of conflict, so we're now evaluating if it really makes sense to run it on top of OpenStack, or if it makes sense to just order more blades inside Kubernetes directly, and then uh, have a Kubernetes cluster running a sides or OpenStack private cloud, or even run OpenStack on top of Kubernetes then. Uh, we're, as I said, we're still in the evaluation phase of it. Um, yes, yeah, so basically what Terraform allows you is to do something initially. So basically, yeah, we have salt master and salt uh, minion actions. And so basically, we're just inside salt, cloning the repository that consists of a, that, that has all the salt code in it. And then we're just attempting to do a salt apply to all the minions five times, uh, partially due to when we adopted it, salt not doing everything we wanted, partially because we didn't write the most beautiful salt code. Yes. No, not really. So it's like, the things that it does is mainly install Docker, update the packages that we have on there, uh, put a bunch of dot .files on it, start Panteras, start Nomad, and then that's pretty much about it. Because, well, that's a cool thing, right? We don't really need much to have them on the nodes. Yes, yes, definitely. Good, well then, enjoy your longer than expected break. <laughs>